The motivation for this research is that we, we look at what are the most important causes of death and disability uh, in Canada and countries like Canada. And chronic diseases are by far and away the most important. They're responsible for almost 90% of all death and disability. So that's things like diabetes, uh, heart disease. And if we want to, to address that problem, we can think about treatment and what we would do to, to help people once they have those conditions. But even better is to think about how we prevent those conditions so that people don't ever actually get diabetes or heart disease in the first place. So to, to think about prevention, we have to look at what are the factors that cause these chronic diseases. And it turns out one of the most important factors is diet, in the sense that it's one of the, one of the factors that really is responsible for a large part of these chronic diseases. But to do something about it, we have to know what people are actually eating, and we have to have some idea of how we can modify or help them make better choices. So traditionally, the way that, that uh, data are gathered on what people eat is by asking them, by doing a survey. The problem with surveys is that they're expensive to do, they're not done very frequently, and they don't give us the, the data that we need at, at the level of a neighborhood, for example, so they don't have that precision. So we looked around to see what, what other ways we could find data about what people eat. And through talking to people in the School of Management, our colleagues who work in marketing, we realized that in fact stores are, are actually collecting in real time when people buy, buy products, these data. So these data, as people purchase something, goes over a scanner and the data are actually entered into a database. In the past, the food industry has been using scanner data at the aggregate level, national level, for example, to understand consumer behavior. Um, what David and uh, Professor Laura Dubé wanted to do was actually to use some of this scanner data at a higher resolution, so at the neighborhood level, postal code level, to actually capture some of the nutrition information. So we start with the data that comes from the scanners, or the scanning databases in every store, and we can pull those together. And then so for every product that's purchased, we have a little bit of information about it. We know the name of the product, we know the price of the product, and we have a code, the UPC code, you know, that barcode you see on the back of everything you buy. It doesn't tell us actually what the nutritional value of that product is or how healthy it is. So to get that information, we have to link every purchased item, so every can of Coke, for example, or every box of cereal, we have to link that to another database that has that nutritional information, tells us how much sugar, you know, the information on that little box on the back of the product, essentially. And then the next step we have to take is to be able to say, well, based on that nutritional content, how healthy is that product? So is, you know, for example, is Coke healthier than orange juice? And it, it sounds like a simple question, but it's actually not so simple. So one of the first products we looked at was sugary soft drinks. And so we, we crunched the numbers, we did all the, the connections we had to the linkage, and then we created a map, essentially, looking at the amount of sugary soft drinks bought by neighborhood in Montreal. And that's quite useful because it shows us you know, which neighborhoods are buying more of this product, which in this case we think is not as healthy as perhaps some other alternatives. And it gives us some opportunities to look at how that, those purchasing patterns over Montreal might relate to other variables or other things like, for example, household income, which we looked at in that, this particular study. And that then allows public health uh, and other groups to think about strategies or ways that they might help people in those particular neighborhoods to make better choices about those kinds of foods. So today's class is focusing on collaboration and we're looking at the challenges and opportunities that are available here in Montreal. We're going to be delving more into collaboration between McGill and other organizations here in Montreal and also the resources that are available for the students and for you as well in some of the work that, that you do. In alignment with McGill's vision of being more connected with the community groups, one of the things we've realized as we're carrying out research with the community groups is they indicate that they have certain needs, for example, when it comes to social marketing, right? And you have students who have these interests and these skills. So the community group members come to the classes and talk about what their needs are, and the students hear from them firsthand what some of those needs are. How can students like you contribute? It may sound funny, but you are the, the knowledge. You know a lot. You, sh you can come and propose us new way to do it. Like Ni was doing, when they came, they, we, they work, uh, McGill work on something very good for the community. Uh, it's called Vers des environnements ag agroalimentaires plus sains. They work with us, and this is used to go on with, with that project. We're trying to build on that, and it was a really important part of the community. We're doing all these analyses to make available information to, to really help people make healthier food choices. And we do that by sharing this information with different partners, the public health agencies, 
with community groups that may want to mobilize resources in their community to help make people make better choices. We need to share the best practice and we don't really have time to find it. We need new people, young people, people who want to make a change. So we're helping the community groups develop information systems that enable them to figure out their priorities you know, when it comes to nutrition, for example, addressing obesity, what are the priorities and what, what data can they use to actually measure their, their progress? But I think there's a potential to do this on a much larger and more continuous scale and also make these data available to individuals. I think that's really what's going to change people's behavior is when they can really, you know, just like you can have an inventory of every transaction you make, for example, by looking at your visa statement and your bank statement, you could conceivably have an inventory of all the food you've purchased and you could look at that from a health perspective and you could have a dietary budget just like you have a financial budget. And so to me, I think that's the way that this is really gonna have an impact.